So today, as you know, I'm going to be talking about um, facility and event operators biosecurity. And so a little bit about myself so that, oh, ah, sorry, <laughs> we're going to actually start with a little agenda. So I'm going to start with a little bit about myself, then we're going to go into what is biosecurity, because it's a word that we don't think about necessarily with horses. We're going to go through some specific disease examples, and then we're going to um, go through the seven key components to developing a biosecurity program that um, hopefully you can implement some of those practices um, with your horses and on your farms and with your events. Um, so with those seven key components, we're going to address animal access and facility and operational management. Um, and then we're going to go through some of the resources that we have available to you. And as I mentioned, some of those are available in the web links. Um, and then after we are done here, um, this presentation will be posted to the Equestrian Canada website. Um, and you'll be able to access um, the links there as well. So a little bit about myself. I am a large animal internal medicine specialist. I teach at the University of Calgary, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. I do mostly horses, probably about 90 to 95% of my practice is horses. Um, I also do some cattle um, and my favorite alpacas as well. Um, I started out in pony club and hunter jumper um, when I was about five years old and so uh, I got a picture there. We got to go to Australia for Prince Philip Games um, and uh, then since I've been in Alberta here I've uh, decided to try my hand at Western and I got myself a little quarter horse um, and this was this picture was this fall of me uh, moving cattle on our, our lease land. So my background is competitions. Um, we had a boarding stable um, with our family and so a lot of this stuff I was not um, aware of as I was going through and so I think it's really useful information that we can help protect ourselves. So one of my friends um, has a breeding facility and this is the sign that he has at his front gate. And when I first saw it, I was kind of like, oh, that's interesting. It's a little bit overkill. But really when I think about it, this is actually one of the best things that we have out there. And we'll talk today about access management and having signs. Um, but it, it really is something that we don't think about too much with our farms. And especially being a breeding farm, this is really important to use sanitation stations make sure that we have good signage and so we're going to look through on how we can alert visitors to our properties um, that we do care about biosecurity. So our first poll question and I see that some of you have already been filling it out there is do you have a biosecurity plan already? Um, and so we're getting some people filling it in there. I'm going to just broadcast the results here to you guys as well. Um, but it looks like we're at about 50-50. We've been jumping around there. And so I find that that's amazing. If I had done this seminar, you know, a couple years ago even, that I would assume um, from my experience would have been very skewed towards not having a plan. Um, and I think that this is great strides that we're starting to make in the industry. So if we're going to talk about biosecurity, we really need to know what biosecurity is all about. And so biosecurity is the set of practices used to protect horse health by reducing the spread of contagious diseases and pests. So this is really about managing disease risks. There we go. Um, I'm just going to mention that as I go through here today, these are some of the resources that I've used. And um, the one um, that I am going to refer to, and I'll actually give you some page guidelines, is the National Farm um, and Facility Level Biosecurity User Guide, which is, I can get my little pointer here, down here. Um, and you will be able to see it on the side of your screen here that you can also follow along as well. And so with the um, user guide, it's a very detailed document and I can see how it would be kind of overwhelming to look at it first. So I hope that this presentation can walk you through the basics of it. And then as you go through, you can start to look up stuff. Um, the the uh, 
equine biosecurity principles and best practices is also um, very useful, um, a little bit uh, less detailed in some areas and more in others, and they really complement um, the national level. This one was developed originally by um, the Alberta Equestrian Federation, and I was fortunate enough to do some talks um, around Alberta um, in previous years to that document as well. So why is biosecurity so important? Well, really, we want to minimize the transmission of contagious diseases. And so we want to reduce the frequency and severity of diseases if we do end up getting that infection in our population of horses. We need to maintain the overall health, herd health at all levels. So this isn't just at the individual horse, but at all the way up to a national level. And we want to maintain Canada's eligibility to export horses worldwide. We don't want to lose that ability for transport. Now, one of the other things with biosecurity that I think it's almost the most important is the financial and emotional costs that it has if we get disease in our horse population. Um, so that can be not being able to ride at a competition, that could be losing a horse, um, all the way up to, you know, if you have a big outbreak at a facility, that causes a lot of stress, there's a lot of financial considerations, um, and we'll talk about some of those things that have happened in previous outbreaks as well. So I mentioned that the horse isn't we're looking at the overall herd health. And so when we think about it, and a lot of times we think about the individual horse, um, and that's a good way to start because we can affect our own horse quite easily um, in a lot of ways. Um, but that horse is part of a herd. It's usually out with a couple other horses. Um, then we have multiple herds on a farm or facility. And then that farm or facility is really part of our provincial and national herds. And nowadays, with so much movement of horses around the world, the, our national herds actually have a whole lot of international aspects to it as well. And so we can't um, be a little narrow-minded with things. We can start out on an individual level, but a lot of these biosecurity practices are going to help us on very large um, scales as well. And that's, that's key to um, thinking about biosecurity. Okay, so I'm gonna, just going to change to our second poll here, um, and I'm going to ask, what two diseases are you most concerned about? So you can check off two on there, and uh, we'll get an idea of some of the, the ones that, um, all across Canada, that people are worried about. And I'll just be able to broadcast the results here as well. So it looks like strangles and equine infectious anemia are, are taking the lead at the beginning here. Maybe that's because they're at the top of the, the um, poll. Um, but those are two really important diseases, and I, that's a great segue because those are the two that I'm actually going to start out with discussing here. So equine infectious anemia, or swamp fever as it's known, is a viral disease that attacks the horse's immune system. It's a retrovirus, so it's a virus, a specific kind, um, that is closely related to the human immunovirus, or HIV. Now, these horses, um, they have clinical signs. They may have fever. They may be lethargic, not quite right. Um, they may have a loss of appetite, possibly weight loss. They can get abdominal swelling or limb swelling, maybe even loss of coordination. Um, what's really hard with this condition is that these signs may be intermittent. So they may have, you know, a little bit of a demonstration of, say, just the loss of court in coordination, and then they have a temporary recovery, and then they start to show some other signs a couple weeks later. And so because they seem to get better in the middle, it's very difficult to actually um, diagnose this condition in many cases. Uh, this is a map that um, I uh, took from the CFAA website from 2017, just to give you an idea of how um, Canada has fared in the last year. And what you'll notice here is that um, we've had cases, and I'll just bring my little pointer up here again, we've had cases in Quebec, um, Manitoba, 
as well as um, Saskatchewan and Alberta. And on uh, the numbers that are underneath of each of those provinces, the first one is the number of horses that were positive on testing, and the second number is the number of premises that were affected. Um, so it's, you know, we actually in Alberta have a fair number of premises. So there was actually six different locations. Um, and those premises would have gone, gone under quarantine, um, under the government control for that quarantine. Now, this is really important because a lot of the horses can show no clinical signs of this disease. And so they remain carriers and a source of infection for any susceptible animals that are in that area. And so we need to make sure that if we do have a positive animal that we're testing and, and evaluating all the other horses in that area. Um, EIA is transmitted through blood and semen. So flies, mostly biting flies, because they're going to um, actually take the blood in. So horse flies, stable flies, deer flies um, can be the trans, uh, can transmit this virus. But also things that we might be doing. So reusing needles or equipment on the animals. Um, it can go from a mare to the foal in utero. And it can also be, because it's transmitted in semen, um, through a breed eating stallion to the mare. Unfortunately, there's no cure and no vaccine for this disease, which is why it's such an important disease that we're monitoring for and, and, and then um, uh, dealing with it on a large scale level. And so that's um, how this disease becomes a federally reportable disease. So any positive tests um, when horses are tested, um, then are, are communicated immediately up the, the, the chain so that we can have the CFAA respond to the, to the situation. Most of the cases are going to result in, in euthanasia of those horses because they can be carriers um, and be transmitting that disease to other horses. The next one, and I see it's still pretty popular on our poll over on the side here, um, is strangles. Uh, right now, it's actually probably, it is the highest um, one that um, everyone in, in attendance is concerned about. And strangles, um, it, the, the incidence of strangles varies across, the, uh, across Canada, but it's still um, pretty prominent and something that we're always concerned about. And it's a good one to think about our biosecurity protocols for. Um, so I just pulled some things from the news over the last couple years um, because it does come up in the news. And so you can see we had the RCMP ride. We have a racetrack um, that uh, confirmed strangles. Also, um, here in Alberta, um, about a year ago, we had um, a horse that had a, a fatal strangles condition. And so it gets into the, the non-equine news as well as most of our equine news as, as we're following along. So strangles is caused by a bacteria. Um, it's called Streptococcus equi equi. It's highly contagious. The clinical signs um, are usually seeing lymph node abscesses, and, and this is most common, as you can see in these photos, um, down underneath of the, the mandible, so under, between the jaws, because the, the lymph nodes that are most affected are at the back of the throat and then they drain with gravity and they come down to the bottom of the, the throat latch area and that's where you might see the abscess burst down there. They have fever, they may have loss of appetite and lethargy, um, difficulty breathing and that's where the term strangles comes from is because those lymph nodes are so swollen around the back of the throat um, that it can actually um, cause significant respiratory distress and sometimes we might even have to put in a tracheostomy in order for the horse to breathe um, from the windpipe, uh, avoiding the upper airway. One of the other things about strangles that is quite uh, frustrating for owners and horses and veterinarians alike is that we can have some alternative forms of it. And so one of them causes abscesses within the body. So it could be the chest, the abdomen, um, even some of the muscles, and that's called bastard strangles. And then there are some conditions where it can create um, an immune response, an improper immune response, and cause muscles to become inflamed, so a myositis. Um, but it can also cause blood vessels to become um, leaky, and they can get what's called purpura hemorrhagica, which is, um, can be quite fatal as well. 
Um, the side effects may be associated with vaccines, so it's always important to discuss um, a vaccination program and how to vaccinate your, your horse uh, with a veterinarian prior to, to, uh, to doing that. The next disease that I'm going to talk about is influenza, and it's one of the most common respiratory diseases that we see. A lot of times we think about it in our young horses, and we see a lot of this associated with our race barns where a lot of young animals are coming together and, and um, to, to a new stressful environment. Again, it's highly contagious, and it's transmitted by aerosol um, or direct content from horse to horse. So that could be snorting or coughing. And it has been reported that it can travel as far as 30 meters. And so that's a very long distance um, for those aerosols um, to travel. Um, if you think about a barn, most of them are, are less than 30 meters long. So we could have tra transmitted it to all of the horses um, in the, um, the barn. And I'm just seeing that we had some questions there about EIA. Um, I'll just step back for one second. Mosquitoes don't tend to transmit EIA because they don't um, take enough blood and transmit it to the next horse. Mostly we're talking about flies when we're talking about um, equine infectious anemia. Um, other things with influenza, so clinical signs of coughing, nasal discharge, fever, depression, loss of appetite, I think you're starting to see a little bit of a trend here in that a lot of our contagious diseases start in the same way and it's really hard to distinguish them when we first see them. Um, most of the time recovery from influenza is within 10 days, but what will happen in some cases is if the horse isn't rested um, for a period of time, then they're going to continue to get sick. So it's similar to us going to work with a cold, it kind of drags on a bit longer than if we actually take the time to rest and um, uh, to re let our immune system really fight that. The other thing that can happen is any viral um, infections that we can have, um, especially in the upper airways, they, we can have secondary bacterial infections. So um, we can have a prolonged course from these. The immune protection for the natural immunity as well as our vaccination immunity is fairly short and that's why what, this is one of the vaccines that we might do more frequently than once a year depending on your risk level. Another disease that can cause upper respiratory tract um, infections is uh, rhinopneumonitis or equine herpes virus. There's a couple different virus types that we relate with respiratory disease and we're, we're now also discovering more. So one in four are probably the most common, although we have seen stuff with herpes virus type two and five as well. These respiratory viruses can cause problems in the respiratory tract, again, fairly non-specific respiratory tract signs, um, especially in the young horses, similar to the influenza. Um, but there's also some conditions that are a bit more of a concern in some cases, such as abortion of pregnant mares if they're infected with the herpes virus, um, and neurologic disease, which we will talk about um, a little bit later in the presentation today. Again, similar to influenza, this is spread by aerosol or direct contact with secretions or contaminated equipment or drinking water. Um, and the virus may be latent in the body, and this is similar to the, the human virus um, that we see with chicken pox. It can be latent there and it can be reactivated later in life. Um, the immune protection is also short, similar to influenza. And so when we're talking about our biosecurity practices, I put some pictures of my horses up here. These are my old guys, um, uh, Sydney and Tanzan. Uh, Tanzan is now in almost 30 in, a, in about a month now. Um, and, you know, they have a great life. They're old. They've been vaccinated their whole life. But they are still at risk of having these respiratory viruses. And so you'll notice in their paddock, they actually have their own bucket, so they're not sharing a communal bucket source, but there is ability to contact over the fences. And we'll talk about looking at our property and identifying some of those risks that could um, lead to having an infectious disease spread between horses in just a couple minutes. Um, so the last disease that I'm going to talk about here is rotavirus. And uh, this virus affects foals. Um, they can be from as young as three days old all the way up to kind of 
five or six months. It has a very short incubation time, which is why the very young foals can have this. So they can ingest it. So it's usually some um, fecal material and manure that has the virus in it and they've touched it to their mouth. Um, it's highly contagious. Um, so we don't know exactly in foals what the amount is, um, but in pigs, this is quite a big problem. And to give you an idea of the magnitude, in pigs, 90 virus particles are infective to cause disease in them. And one gram of feces, so that's really tiny amount, just one gram, um, contains 10 to the 10. So we're looking at kind of millions of millions of particles in one gram of feces. And so just a tiny bit of manure can be very infectious um, to, the, to, our, to our population of susceptible animals. Luckily, rotavirus is usually self-limiting, meaning that they're going to show other clinical signs of not feeling very well and having diarrhea, but they're able to clear the infection on their own. Um, younger animals are more susceptible to having um, secondary issues and complications, and so they can be more affected by this. What's really a, a difficult thing in controlling this condition is that the shedding of the virus actually starts before the diarrhea starts. So that means that we end up having virus particles in our environment before we even know we have an issue. Um, and then those virus particles can be shed up to two weeks after the resolution of the diarrhea. And so these are really important things to know when, we're, when we've diagnosed a condition um, in your animal in terms of how we're going to isolate and how we're going to install the biosecurity protocols so that we can um, minimize the transmission to other animals that um, may be around on your farm. Okay, so I'm going to get up our third poll here. Let's see here. And this one is, oops, um, do you know of any um, horses that have been affected by an infectious disease? So right off the bat, we've got almost everyone here who has um, known a horse that has been affected by an infectious disease. And if you've been in the horse industry for any amount of time, you're probably going to have um, some contact with someone or even one of your own horses. So today we're going to try and go into some of those practices um, to be able to um, educate you on how you can minimize um, the issues that surround that infectious disease. Look at that, 91%. That's, that's a large number of us. So if we think about disease in itself, we have to think about what's going to affect it. And so just having those viral particles of rotavirus in the environment isn't going to be the only thing um, that's going to cause disease. Yes, they have to be there, and that's where the agent comes in. So um, the agent is the pathogen or the, whatever is causing the disease. It could be a virus, a bacteria, it could be a protozoan, a parasite. Um, we have to have the host, which in this case are our horses, um, but we also have, the right, have to have the right set of environment. And so those aren't just environment in terms of the farm, which is very important, the paddock, maybe um, the, it, the right weather conditions for certain um, pathogens, but it's also the right environment within the host. So we're dealing with a whole set of complex um, a whole set of complex issues that are, have to come together in order to be able to have that disease occur. And so when we're looking at our biosecurity plan, we have to look at all three aspects of that as well. So really, when we're talking about biosecurity, we're looking at risk management. So we have to balance the risk of disease transmission, the consequences of having a disease occur, and the, min the measures that are required to minimize disease. And so today I'm going to be talking about um, a whole bunch of different conditions that you could, or, or um, components that you can implement on your own property and, and with your um, horses. Not all of them are going to be appropriate for you. Not all of them are possible for you. But what I want you to start thinking about is these three things. What is my risk for disease? And we'll talk about, you know, how do we identify those? 
what is the consequence if these diseases occur? And that could go back to those financial and emotional um, costs that we talked about before, as well as how much does it cost and how practical is it for me um, to put these measures in place? And so we'll go through each of these by building your biosecurity plan. Um, so, as I mentioned before, the user guide um, has all sorts of information for you to be able to implement best practices of biosecurity. So the first one we're going to start with is developing the specific biosecurity plan, and this is on page 22 of the user guide. And I apologize that it says one's all on the side. When we uploaded it, it decided that I couldn't have seven steps, only one. So the first step that we are going to do is to make a facility diagram that includes the traffic routes, the storage areas, everything that we um, have on our property we need to think about. And so um, this is one that I kind of designed here and we'll go through it. Um, I'm trying to get my pointer is still not wanting to move for me, so I'll actually do my little drawing, I think. So, um, when we are drawing, make sure you do it from a bird's eye view, meaning come down from the top and um, look down and be able to see all of the different aspects because it's a different view than what we're used to seeing our farm. We tend to look at it from just straight on as we drive in the front door, um, but we need to look from the top down. And so what um, I have on this um, diagram is it's somewhat our teaching facilities at the university just altered a little bit for demonstrations um, but you'll notice that I have where the parking is I have where the horses are located so we have our barn with our tack room we have our uncovered pens which do have run-in shelters um, they also have um, waters and so you'll notice that the water troughs in this case are actually shared between paddocks and so that means that it's it's uh, horses in one paddock are going to be able to be nose to nose as well as sharing the actual water um, be with the horse beside them. I've also indicated where the manure pile is at the back and um, some of the traffic routes that are used to get around the property. And on the very back of it, we have our property um, fence line, um, which then we would, it's always useful to have that there so we can have, is, is there fences from the neighboring property a, a directly adjoining? Is there a barn right there? Um, and take this look going down. Um, make sure that you've got all of the areas um, Kind of mapped out and then as we go through our program we're going to our biosecurity program we're going to start to identify areas just like i said those waters are one of the biggest concerns that i have in this diagram in terms of areas that are critical that we need maybe need to address or think of ways of of adapting our our programs so um, drawing this is our first step, um, and hopefully you will all go home after this, and uh, I guess you're already at home, but you will start to draw that. The second step of this is to identify the risks. So what are the diseases that are a concern? Now, even just across Canada, this um, is going to have different diseases. So in Ontario, you know, that that's where I'm from originally, and we had a lot more salmonella risk with horses than we do out here. Out here, we in the West, we have a lot more um, strangles than I saw when I was back in Ontario. And so discussing these potential risks with your veterinarian and knowing what's there is, is one of the first steps. You also have to consider the susceptibility of horses. So do you have any very young or very old horses? Um, do you have any horses that are debilitated for some reason? Um, mares and foals are at higher risk. Um, consider the use of the horses, um, as well as the travel and movement of horses on and off the property. And all of these things are going to come together to give us um, kind of a list of the, the diseases that we're going to be most concerned about for ourselves. The next step is um, to use that diagram that you've drawn of your farm and 
list your daily activities. So mucking, how do you bring the manure? What's the route that they go? How do you bring your hay um, in? Where do you walk? All of those things on it. And then complete a self-assessment tool. And so um, this one that's on the screen here is part of um, the biosecurity standards, the CFIA National Equine Biosecurity Standards. Um, but other options, there are lots of these out there. The Equine Guelph has a biosecurity calculator that you can do online. Um, the Alberta Equestrian Federation has one on their um, website as well. And the Saskatchewan um, has the Horse Biosecurity Guidebook, which also include, includes one. Um, so you have lots of options, um, depending on your preference. Some of them are more detailed than others. Really, what I want you to do is actually just sit down and be honest. So if you have a no, put the no there. That's totally okay. You're not going to be yeses going down the entire um, form. Um, even in my best um, facilities or veterinary places, we don't have yeses, all of them. But it's because we're going to look at those and make sure that we're knowing where our risks are. Um, and so fill those out. Um, that's our next step. Following that, what we're going to do is we're going to refer back to um, the biosecurity user guide and the standard to identify some of the best practices that are associated with some of the no's that you, or sometimes, you may have written down sometime as well, that you've identified on that, um, that form. Also, use your veterinarian. So the next time that your veterinarian is out, um, or maybe even book an appointment just for it, to be able to walk through and talk about these things. Um, it's much better to have a preventative aspect of it than dealing in the time when you have issues. And so um, I'm a big proponent at wellness exam time to talk about biosecurity as well um, with your veterinarian. So once you have a strategy, um, or at least you've identified what you want to deal with on your property, is then you're going to have to prioritize, because we can't do everything, we can't do it all at once. So create those short-term goals as well as long-term goals, and write those down so that you can keep yourself accountable to it. Um, then you're just going to have to, you know, start plugging away, but don't forget to review the effectiveness of that plan. Um, things will change. Different diseases are going to come. You'll have different horse population. You may have different waters. You may have different staff or other op things on your facility are going to change. And so the implementation is only the first step. The review is really key um, to following up with your biosecurity plan. So now that we have thought about our plan, we've looked at our property, we've looked at um, our, our horses, what we need to think about, we're going to um, go into a little bit more detail on what this might look like. So our next step is to monitor and maintain animal health um, and disease response. So this is on page 26 of our guide. And so again, I have our disease triad here that we need to have all three of those things come together in order to um, get disease, but we really have to come in contact with that agent in order for our horses to be sick. So how does that happen? Well, it can happen with direct contact from animal to animal. It can be indirect, so through a vector. So vectors, we were talking about mosquitoes and flies earlier. Those are vectors. It could be that you are the vector and you're transmitting it on yourself um, to another end. We could have dogs. Um, There's some diseases that are transmitted through um, rodents or possums. And so um, pest control is really important. It can also be transmitted through fomites, and that's a, a fancy term that just means an inanimate object. So that could be your muck bucket. I always give the example that when you're mucking out stalls, we have our wheelbarrow um, that goes down in the stalls, and almost every horse, if they're in the stall while you're mucking out, is going to put their head out and put it into the muck bucket because there might be some good hay. Um, that is left behind. And so they're actually coming in contact with the manure of other horses that they may not normally. Um, so that's through an inanimate objects um, that they come in contact with. 
We talked about influenza and herpes virus with aerosol, um, so transmission through the air, but it can also be ingestion, so ingestion through your water source or contaminated feed um, or um, out in the pastures or paddocks. So the next aspect is how are we going to decrease our exposure to these pathogens? We now know how they can get to our horses, but we really have to, you know, manage how our horses come in contact with it. So we're going to address all three of these aspects, and they're kind of the pillars of any biosecurity program, which is the animal management, access management, and facility or operational management. And we'll get into much more detail as we go along here. So the animal management, um, one of the first things to do is separation of new arrivals that are coming onto the farm because they're, your population and the population and of the horse that is coming in are different. They have different, um, they've had different experiences, they've been exposed to different things and may have different health statuses. Separations of potentially higher risk horses. So I always recommend that if you have um, horses that never leave the farm and they're kind of your stable farm population, that they stay together. And then the horses that are going on and off the farm um, because they are um, showing or, or traveling a fair amount, that they're in a slightly different population or, or paddock on your farm pasture. So that those that are staying there are separated from the other ones. This is also really important with brood mares and foals. You want to keep those ones um, in, all together instead of being mixed with your other populations. Um, and those foals are really can be quite susceptible to a lot of diseases that adults aren't. And so that can help out quite a bit there. And when you're handling these animals, it's really important to go to your lowest risk, um, your healthy before the sick, and your young and your old first before um, kind of your middle-aged ones. So you're wanting to, to make sure that you're not bringing anything to the horses that um, could potentially transmit um, to ones that are, are more susceptible to disease. The next aspect of infection control is to decrease the susceptibility to disease through preventative care. Um, I am a huge proponent, as I've already mentioned, of yearly wellness examinations. So at the time that we're doing our vaccinations, um, book the extra time to have a physical exam and a wellness exam by your veterinarian at that time. It's a great time to talk about nutrition, um, parasite control, vac vaccination protocols for the whole year, dental care, um, the environment that they're in on the farm. And so really we, what we're trying to do is decrease um, or increase the horse's immune system throughout the year and ensure that they're at the healthiest that they possibly can be. And identifying anything that may um, make them susceptible is, it can be done sometimes quite quickly at those exams. And so it's not only though at that time about looking at the individual horse, we also have to think about um, looking at the entire herd um, that's on that farm. And so the reason for that is what we call herd immunity. So what we're trying to do is if we have a population of say 10 horses and only one horse um, is healthy or has been vaccinated and the other horses we don't really know, they may be susceptible to disease and you can get such a high level of um, disease there or transmission that the one horse that is vaccinated gets sick. Versus if we have 10 horses that are all protective and they've got their vaccines, they're all on the same protocol, we know they're all healthy, and we have one horse that's less healthy, we don't have a huge population of susceptible animals, and it's actually more likely that that one horse is going to stay healthy. So we're looking at trying to make the whole herd immune as well as the individual horses. And that's where developing a herd health plan for an entire facility is, is, can be quite helpful for us. Um, next is increase the resistance to disease. So I've talked a bit about vaccination programs and I, I think it's really important to discuss this with your veterinarian to decide which diseases you should vaccinate for. 
what should be your core vaccines, so the ones that are done every single year, and then the other ones that may be done um, based on the risk of that year or where you're going to be or if you're going to be showing or moving around. Um, and so discussing what would be the best option for your horse and your facility um, and making sure that we do get that um, herd immunity. As we know, vaccines are not 100% effective all the time. They may be good vaccines and decrease the severity of the, the disease, but you may still be able to get disease in those cases. And so um, knowing inform further information about the vaccines can also help us. They're not the uh, magic bullet that's going to 100% protect us from every infectious disease that's out there. The next one is to treat with medications to control infectious diseases. So if we have a disease that is treatable, um, using the appropriate and judicious use of antibiotics is really important. And you're going to hear more and more about this in the next year because some of the guidelines and the, um, and, uh, the requirements um, are going to be changing with um, antibiotics use in Canada as we go along this year. So you're going to hear more and more about this. What we're trying to do is make sure that we can keep our animals healthy with the antibiotics while making sure that we don't get resistance problems that can occur when we have inappropriate use or indiscriminate use of the antibiotics. So we want to use them to keep everyone safe, um, but we also don't want to overuse them or use them inappropriately. Um, my last point on this slide is about maintaining individual horse health records. Um, Everyone always jokes because I come with a binder whenever I go to a new boarding facility with my animal to show them all of his information about um, his health. Um, but even for yourself, having some of that information um, available is really important. You may not know um, exactly what your vaccination protocol you've done for the last few years if you if you have changed veterinarians or you haven't collected records from each of the veterinarians that you've gone to and so keeping a record for yourself of all of the the horse issues that have gone on um, is very important um, and can actually help us as veterinarians to identify if there's a condition that may have um, been brewing for some time with some of those information that you collect Um, so identifying disease and illness. Um, so I, I'm going to go back to that wellness exam again, but it's a good time to talk to your veterinarian on how to do a temperature pulse and respiration on your horse. So how can you get the, the pulse of your horse um, performing a rectal temperature um, collection as well as getting the respiratory rate and knowing what's normal on them. Um, I always give the example of I left one of my stethoscopes for my mom to use at home when I went away to school and I forgot to teach her how to use it. And so it, it doesn't work so well in when you're in a stressful situation and you don't know how um, to collect this information because it can be very valuable um, information to know what's normal for your horse. So doing this on times when it's healthy. Um, then we know if something's different and also to provide that inter information to your veterinarian um, when you talk to them. And so promptly identifying disease and illness is going to minimize the spread and overall improve the well-being of your horse if we can identify it quicker. So we always recommend establishing criteria um, for your facility. Um, we also call these sometimes isolation triggers. Um, so a fever, this is a temperature, a rectal temperature of greater than 38.9 degrees Celsius. Um, maybe the horse is unable to stand, that's a, that's a pretty good uh, um, trigger there. Aggressive behavior or a stupor where they're not aware of their surroundings, profuse diarrhea, um, incoordination or mucoid nasal discharge are some of the ones, um, the, some of the big key ones, but there may be other ones um, that you want to have as triggers that you should discuss with your veterinarians. All right, so the next one here is to have a disease response and emergency preparedness protocols. So this is having things in place to begin with 
so that um, if there is a disease outbreak or an emergency, um, I know in, in southern Alberta right now we're dealing with floods in the Tabor area and in Ontario they're dealing with an ice storm at the moment. And so the first part of that is um, to have animal and premise identification. So you want to post this information in an area that's accessible but also have access to this this information if you have to leave the farm or aren't able to get into the farm. So having backups of this information. These would include a premise ID for the farm, the exact ge geographic location, so not just the street number, but having more detailed information on the location, and then the animal description um, and owner contact details. And so that animal description is going to really include what it looks like, does it have socks, um, is there any permanent identification on that horse, which I highly recommend, so do you have a microchip, um, which can be um, easily performed in the horses, a tattoo, a brand, um, something that we can identify the horse if you have to um, leave the area. All of this stuff surrounding um, infectious control is really, we've talked about being prepared for it, and one of the best ways to be prepared for it is to make sure that you have boarding agreements or facility contracts that outline it to begin with, so that anyone coming onto your property is aware of what your um, expectations are, what their responsibilities are, um, having delegated authority in case there's an emergency to have um, first aid done or veterinary care, um, information on, on travel, is there a, other people that they can contact. And so those boarding agreements and facility contracts are really key to have it up front and have that discussion first. Also along with being prepared um, in these protocols are to make sure that stuff is written down. So standard operating procedures. So this is how things are going to be communicated. Um, what are the procedures if you have to set up an isolation area? What is going to be the movement of animals? So who is going to be allowed to leave if we have um, horses that are diseased on the farm? Um, what happens if you have a horse um, that um, either dies or is euthanized? How are we going to deal with that? Do we know how we can, who we can get to pick it up? Um, and know the protocols for there. And one of the big ones, especially when we have events, is is there a backup for water or electricity if we lose those? So a lot of um, wells are not going to be able to supply water to the animals there um, if there's no electricity. And so thinking about those things um, and having a plan in place first um, is really important. Communications, I think, is one of the things that can make or break um, an emergency or disease outbreak situation. Um, I've been through a bunch of these, and, and really, at the beginning, we want to know when we're going to contact the veterinarian, who's going to contact them. But then it's also about the response um, with factual information. And we all know how social media can go crazy. Um, you know, oh, so-and-so barn has strangles and all the rest of it. And now we start getting um, negative publicity, which can be harm very harmful, especially when it's not factual. Um, I'm going to talk about soon the EHV1 or neurologic herpes outbreak that we had. And on Facebook, I was seeing death threats for people. Like it, it can just be crazy. And so we want to make sure that we have a strategy that we can get information out um, and not have panic. Um, and then for all of this stuff with emergency and disease response, we need to have backup plans for our backup plans. Really, we need to kind of think about um, and brainstorm what could go wrong in each of those situations. Okay, so we're on to number three, which is the movement and transportation of horses on page uh, 43 of our user guide. So I mentioned we were going to talk about the neurologic um, equine herpes virus outbreak. Um, this was, uh, we talked before about res uh, the respiratory disease. Um, there's also abortion. And then there is a neurologic form. And that can happen with the wild type of the, the virus, but you can also get neurologic signs um, with a specific neuropathic strain um, that's a mutated strain. And so what we'll sometimes call this is EHM, or equine herpes virus myeloencephalitis. 
Now, this is back in June, May and June of 2011 that this occurred, and there was a cutting horse competition down in Ogden, Utah, and I'm sure many of you have heard of this. There was 421 horses at the showgrounds um, that were registered. We don't actually know the 100% the exact number because there was a lot of horses that also attended the show who were in training and basically came along um, to the show to be trained at the show and not necessarily competing in it. And this outbreak essentially shut down um, the cutting horse industry in both the US and Canada. It had major um, repercussions um, for both industries as well as other associated industries. So this information has come from um, uh, the investigation that occurred after the outbreak um, in the U.S. and they did an amazing job of following up with the cases with the survey um, of all of the owners that attended the, co the, the competition. So in the end, in the U.S., there was 90 confirmed cases of either equine herpes virus 1 or the neurologic um, cases. So there was 19 states um, that were affected by this. Um, there was 54 cases um, of the herpes virus that, that were actually at the event. So of those 421 horses that were there, um, 54 of them um, ended up contracting this disease. And then there was 36 cases um, that were secondary or tertiary exposed cases, meaning that the horses came home from the competition and then they exposed other horses at the facility that they went home to and those horses became diseased. Or it could have been in cases of tertiary where the first horse was at the show, they went home and then, the, then they were exposed to another one. There was 13 horses that died or were euthanized in the States and we'll go into Canada in one second. Um, the information with the, with the trace back that went on was that overall there was almost 1,700 horses that were either secondary or tertiary exposed um, to the horses that were originally there. And so on the map here you can see where Ogden, Utah is um, represented with the blue star and then all the states that had um, red dots are ones that had both um, primary cases that were at the show as well as secondary. Um, and then the ones that have green dots had primary cases from when they went home. So in Canada, we also were affected by this. So there was about 56 horses that attended this competition from Canada, um, mostly from Alberta, BC, and Saskatchewan. Um, from looking at the data um, that I have available, it looks like in the end we had about 13 confirmed cases in Alberta, um, in which one was confirmed um, at, that, it, that it had um, the neurologic form when it, it passed away, and then two other horses died that had signs consistent with um, the disease but did not end up um, having the, a test positive. There was also horses in BC and Saskatchewan that came up positive. And so this isn't something that stays between borders. And that's really important to think about when we talk about diseases is that the border is not a disease line. Things can cross across and um, we have to try and minimize that risk. But it is um, disease can be exposed um, all over the place um, and, and travel fairly quickly as is evidenced. Um, by this outbreak. So how are we going to manage some of these disease risks while we're traveling? Well, um, we're going to um, have a vaccination program that's not only good for where we're home from, but also looking at what diseases and what vaccinations are important to where you're going to. You need to, um, I highly recommend monitoring rectal temperatures daily because a lot of times fever can um, be the first sign that we do see and a lot of times we miss it if we're not actually monitoring their temperatures. Um, ensure that the stall in the area that you put your horse in is clean and disinfected before bringing your horse into it and so that may be discussing that with your, um, your event facility staff. 
creating barriers between stalls. So I see a lot of stalls that are, are built for excellent ventilation and they have bars, um, but the horses are able to touch nose between them. So even something as simple as putting up a blanket or a sheet um, can reduce that nose to nose. It's not gonna stop the aerosols, but that direct nose to nose contact can be reduced. Avoid using communal waters, troughs, or feed sources. Um, I see a lot of people using communal water troughs when they're on trail rides and such. Um, and so having your own bucket um, that, and your own water. Um, and a lot of times horses like your water from home, so that's helpful. Um, use your own trailer as a tie rail. Um, so instead of um, kind of lining up all the horses on a tie rail if they are, um, using your own trailer for that so that they don't have that ability to touch noses. And if you have to use a tie rail, then try and choose a non-porous one that you can disinfect. And I really like, I carry around Lysol wipes um, with me. Um, they're quite good. You can wipe off that area. Um, or if you have a, uh, there's other types of wipes um, that you can get at your veterinarian as well. Um, but that's just going to reduce the load of what's on it. It may not be 100%, but it may be reducing part of that load. And then uh, I've mentioned this a couple times, but don't come in direct contact with other horses. So I remember showing and standing in the ring uh, after doing the hunter class and we line up and all the horses are close enough that they're touching nose to nose. And really you only know uh, in those situations about the health of your horse. And so trying to keep away and not letting your horse do that um, can be quite um, important. And then using your own equipment, um, cross ties, uh, your wa own water hose. We tend to forget about water hoses and that's something that um, uh, I talk a lot about, especially in breeding operations, is that we can be cleaning, 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 um, getting everything disinfected, but the water hose gets drug across the ground and is almost always never cleaned. And so thinking about cleaning the end of that water hose, not submerging the end of the water hose in the water bucket when you go to fill up a bucket um, is going to reduce the chance of contaminating um, the, the water source. All right, I have one more disease here, and this is a, one that's um, in the news, and if you've done any traveling to the States with your horses, it's, it's um, quite an important one. And so this is equine pyroplasmosis. Um, it's, these are protozoan parasites, um, blood parasites, that are usually transmitted through ticks in um, more warmer climates than we are here in, uh, in uh, Canada right now. Um, but it's also um, transmitted um, through anything that's going to move blood from horse to horse. Right now, the biggest issue with this in the U.S. is um, in some of the bush track or the um, off track uh, quarter horse racing industry, we're starting to see um, some of um, this, uh, it's not the sanctioned events at all, it's the, the backyard or the bush tracks, um, where there's sharing of um, needles between horses. Um, and so I put a picture there of the needle and we don't, th we think about a needle being fairly small and not going to hold a whole lot of um, material, but after it's been inserted into a horse, whether it's the muscle or the vein, it's always going to contain little particles of blood within it. Same thing with our IV set and tubing, um, that contains some blood as well. And so these are supposed to be single use. Um, and, but what we're seeing is that we're seeing more outbreaks of pyroplasmosis um, at, in the states and some of that has been, some of the larger ones have been linked back to reusing needles, syringes or IV sets. You can also get these through blood transfusions um, or infected from a mare to the fetus during pregnancy. Again, we have fairly similar nondescript signs of this, so they may start with weakness, loss of appetite, fever, they have an anemia, may have weight loss or swellings of the legs or the abdomen, um, their gums and their eyes can look yellow, um, so jaundice. But some of these horses can be chronic carriers that aren't really showing signs. And those are the ones that, similar to EIA that can um, be the, the biggest contributors um, to the transmission of this disease.
This is also a federally reportable disease um, that uh, is of utmost importance that we keep it out of Canada. And because of that, we do have some restrictions of travel from states that are currently active with pyroplasmosis um, and required testing as well from certain states or, or certain restrictions. And so it's really a good reminder of knowing what are the diseases um, in the area that you're going to, as well as knowing what you need to do to be able to um, maintain your horse's health and to return to Canada what needs to be done there as well. So we talked about moving horses kind of on a bigger scale, but let's talk about movement of horses onto our farms. And so I would say that most facilities don't tend to have um, any kind of separation for new horses coming into them. Um, we think of horses as everyone maintains, you know, really healthy horses, but really when we have disease outbreaks, it's usually one horse that just slips through the cracks and comes in and there hasn't been um, some kind of separation. Um, so in a second, I'll show you some guidelines, but it's important to think about what you want your ho the horses that are coming onto your property or to your event um, to have. So, you know, maybe it's requesting the records to know about their vaccine and deworming and, and equine infectious anemia testing prior to arriving on the farm. Um, having isolation pro protocols or separating those horses so that um, different people are working with them or they're worked with last after the rest of the resident population. Um, minimizing animals that can run through the different areas. Uh, you know, we all have dogs on our farms, but they're actually great at going from one area to the next and, and bringing the manure from one to the other on themselves or um, uh, on our equipment that we move back and forth. So having your own equipment for these uh, separate horses um, and monitoring rectal temperatures initially on their entrance. And we'll talk about timelines in a minute. Also, when we have horses that are visiting, um, it, it's again important to have some predetermined health status on what you feel comfortable um, knowing that those horses are helpful, uh, healthy. Um, keep them separate from the resident herd. Um, using different equipment and don't forget about the trailer so parking in designated areas what's going to happen with the manure that's on that trailer um, if it's just put into the muck bucket that's in the barn then that's not keeping them separate um, in that case so these are some suggested separation times. They are not always possible. Um, and, and all of us veterinarians realize that, um, but it's something to think about and to use as a starting point to decide on what your practice can be. And so the way that we look at it and the way that it's described in the user manual is, um, are the horses that are coming onto your property low risk, medium risk, or high risk? And so with our low risk, these are horses that we know their health status, maybe they've had a um, physical exam in the last um, five to seven days um, by a veterinarian, they haven't been in contact with any other sick horses, um, these are really low risk. And so keeping them separate for a few days um, is going to be kind of our, um, just to monitor, monitor those rectal temperatures. As we go up to the medium risk and the higher risk, then we're getting into more time that's separate. And really those high risk horses are horses that we have no idea of what their health status is. Um, so examples are rescued horses, horses from sales, um, horses that um, have been seized, those, those kinds of things. We don't know what's been going on. And so those are gonna pose um, the longest risk. And, and one of the big things that with that 21 to 28 days is, is that most of our diseases, if you are not a silent carrier, are going to show up because the incubation periods are less than those 28 days. Usually um, 21 days is getting to the outset of it. So what we're doing is we're keeping them separate so that they are infected, that we'll be able to, to identify it before we expose them to our rest of our population. All right, we're going on to access management, our next one here. And this one is really about using physical barriers or procedures um, to reduce um, the introduction and transmission. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to use that map and we're going to that we designed earlier and we're going to designate controlled access zones and restricted access zones and identified control access points. And so I'll go into all three of those. So control access points are areas where people are entering in. So the front door to the barn, the main gate going onto the property. And so they're usually where everyone has to go through. And this is a great um, location to have signs, um, to have directions on your biosecurity protocols. Um, and there may even be physical barriers so that they can't just all walk in and, and without seeing that information. Really important to use your bird's eye map to help guide this because we don't always recognize all of them. Our controlled access zone is really about the, the land, building equipment, anything that's involved with the care and management of horses. And it's usually the, the first zone um, of, of the property. And so in the guide, we have these pictures that demonstrate it. And the controlled access zone is the yellow um, fencing that is around the outside in this case. Um, and uh, you can, there's um, some exercises within the user guide that you can look at and identify in your property as well. The restricted access zone is where um, further restricted where the horses reside. So that's more the pens, the barns, the pasture, um, separate areas. And on, um, on these maps, they're identified in the red. So they're directly around each of those areas. So if we take the farm that I demonstrated earlier before, and we put our um, controlled access, you'll notice that the house and the parking isn't included on that. Um, when we go to our restricted access, then we're going to include the pastures, we're going to include our pens, the barn. Um, when we have visitors, they may be able to get into the riding ring. Now, one thing that is particular to this case is that we have this hay storage, which is usually part of our controlled access. But based on the location right beside um, the parking area, I would actually say that this should be a restricted zone where we have some signs to indicate, please don't enter in there. Um, just because we want, we don't want to have contamination of people walking from their, their um, parking area and potentially their trailers into the hay storage area. So that I would include that as well in our restricted area here so that we don't have transmission um, or movement of people or, or um, potential pathogens there. So visitor risk um, is, is part of managing that in order to reduce the pathogens that come in. So explaining biosecurity expectations, that sign that I showed you at the beginning, um, that's, uh, that's a great way. And people do read signs. And I always say, if you put up one of those hand sanitization stations, almost everyone's going to stop and use them if it's in an easy, highly visible area. If you have to go around the corner and turn and down a bend, um, people aren't going to use it. So get in there and, and actually using it. Um, identify where you want visitors parking, restrict visitor access to animals. Uh, this is something that I always laugh at when I think about um, some of the, the major places that allow, you know, that allow um, uh, public into the areas. Um, horses, there's no restriction to those horses. And so um, really you don't want someone going down the hallway because the first thing everyone does is put their hands out for the horse to touch their, hand, their nose to their hands and then they go to the next one. And so it's a great way to just spread everything along there. Um, in many of our other livestock species, you have to fill out a, a log book in order to go on to a farm. Now, this isn't really practical um, for a lot of our horse facilities, um, but it is something to think about if you have more of a higher risk, say a breeding facility possibly. Um, and this is for traceback in a lot of ways. So if you do have a sick animal, then you can maybe contact who was there recently to see if they've dealt with something else there. There is also this new app, um, which I was just recently informed on, um, that is being, being used at some of our Canadian farms that's called Be Seen and Be Safe. And so this um, creates a geofence, um, for those of you who are technologically inclined, 
around the farm that you set up and then you ask um, people who are coming to your property to have the app on their phone and then it'll track people coming in and going out and so um, this is something that's been used in poultry facilities um, and other as I say livestock farms and it's it's an option um, it is a free app um, that is available So we've, we've, I've indicated a couple times that we need to isolate any horses that are sick. And so um, when we're setting up an isolation facility, this doesn't have to be something that is um, big and extreme and costly. We can do these um, um, in a practical way as well. If you look at the literature, they're going to say ideally 25 meters from other horses, but really that's not practical in most of our farm situations. So it may be selecting the stall that's at the furthest point from the traffic um, that we can maybe make some buffers with some empty stalls, um, but re or it may be putting up temporary paneling um, uh, in an over in a shed and with so we have some shelter it, it has to be realistic for you but you also have to think about this before you need it or else it can be quite difficult to set up in, in, a, in a pinch. Um, you're going to want to limit the access to only people who have been trained on how to deal with um, the isolation area. Um, you're only going to go there after all of the chores are done with the healthy horses. And we're going to have some per personal protective equipment um, that is you've already got on hand um, in order to protect yourself, your cl underneath clothing, from transmitting it to someone else. Signage is again really important here. I'm always surprised how a little sign on the ground will actually stop most people. And in that top picture there, um, when we put those signs up, people don't cross them. It's, it's got a big, huge fence. And so um, that can work very well. These are going to have frequent cleaning and disinfection. Um, and you're going to need to have some dedicated supplies and equipment to it. So having stuff that is easily disinfectable um, is really important, like halters or lead shanks or stuff that can be disposed of afterwards. Also important to think about how you're going to manage the manure because this may not you're not going to want to put it in your main manure pile um, if it's potentially infectious um, especially if there's any spreading of manure and so usually we recommend bagging and dispose of this manure separately and then once a horse goes into isolation it's really important to have an ongoing discussion with your veterinarian um, and that they don't leave um, isolation until it's cleared by a veterinarian so this is another example of an isolation um, that I've set up. This has a boot dip in front of the stall. Um, we're just using um, some, uh, in this case, surgery um, uh, drapes, or you could use bed sheets. That works as well to create a barrier because this entire door was um, uh, that, that great. And when they have diarrhea, it just sprayed out everywhere and contaminated all of the floor. Um, so we have equipment um, for, for um, keeping us clean when we go in. There's some coveralls. We've got garbages and ready access to stuff that's separate. And you'll notice in the back here we have our equipment that's designated just for this horse. When we're talking about event biosecurity, we've, we've mentioned a lot of these, but just to kind of reiterate, make sure that if you're having an event that you consider that biosecurity first. It's really hard to kind of put things together when you've already got all the stalls set up and you're trying to think of then how to manage the flow. So map it out, plan the movement, post the expectations for anyone who's coming on to that, um, coming to that event, Keep any resident horses from that farm separate from the event horses. Um, use a separate exercise area if possible. Not always possible, but if possible. Try to have no nose-to-nose -nose housing, so having complete walls between um, the stalls. Um, disinfect and clean prior to the event um, so that we have a known status of the stalls before the horses are going in. Assign the stabling and associated facilities to groups. So don't have just one big wash area um, where all of the different barns are going to come together. Try, if possible, to have separate areas for each barn um, so that if there is a disease outbreak, we can try and hopefully maintain it to one smaller area instead of a giant big group um, or the entire facility. 
and ensure that you already have a plan um, for an isolation area. So there are some things that can help you um, with uh, events. Um, this is with the AEF. They have recommendations for event organizers as well as um, the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, Dr. Flynn um, with some others have developed one that is also quite comprehensive as well and those are excellent um, resources if you're having an event. So our last ones that we're going to look at, and they're, they're much briefer than our previous ones. So the last one is farm and facility management. I think we're all pretty aware that making sure that our feed, water, and bedding um, is from quality sources and that they're, um, they're uh, kept um, not exposed to the weather or to pests is really important. Um, stripping and cleaning stalls and disinfecting between horses instead of just swapping around, um, especially when they're um, new to the herd. Property and pest management. We don't tend to think about those rodents and other things causing or transmitting diseases. And so more of they're a pest to us, but they can be quite dangerous to our horses. And so fly and insect traps, reducing the rodent population. I always use this picture. This is Sam, um, one of our clinic cats. And uh, while we, he is an excellent reducer of rodents, he also potentially, um, you know, he's in a muck bucket here, is transmitting a fair amount around. And so making sure that there's areas where they cannot get into, um, such as our isolation areas. Keeping your feed um, covered with um, enclosed bins, cleaning water troughs frequently and removing standing waters, especially for those mosquitoes that can transmit things like West Nile virus and Eastern and Western encephalitis. Um, our pastures, we want to make sure that they're not overstocked because that can cause um, uh, some significant issues to not only the pasture but also um, to the health of our animals there. Having a herd deworming program and monitoring um, what kind of shedding we have on the property with fecal egg counts. Um, rotating pastures or using an all-weather paddock to allow time for our summer pastures to rest. Um, and only spreading manure on our fields after it's fully composted. Um, that's a really big thing. In Canada, we don't reach the temperatures that they do in the southern U.S. that will actually kill any of the parasites. And so by spreading the manure on the farm, we're, we're giving um, ready access for our animals um, to all of the parasites that have been shed. And that can increase um, the word worm burden that's there. And so um, really it has to be fully composted um, and have had a heat cycle in order to get rid of those parasite eggs and, and larvae. And when we're cleaning, um, it's important to be part of our routine. So make it part of the barn chart, uh, chores that are going on. Um, knowing that we have to do this as part of our um, routine makes it um, less uh, uh, less onerous on the whole um, situation. So making sure the equipment, cleaning those muck buckets, cleaning the wheelbarrows on a frequent basis. Um, don't forget the vehicles and the trailers. Trailers are one of the biggest ones that people forget to clean out, um, especially when they've transported a sick horse to somewhere else, say to the clinic. Um, avoid sharing tack and then knowing you disinfect it. So in the user guide on, on page 107, um, there's information on all the different disinfectants. Most disinfectants will not work if there is organic debris um, on the surface that you're cleaning with them. So you really need to do the clean first and then do the disinfectant. And they all have different times of contact um, and different dilution. So it's really important that you know what you're using and, and follow the instructions so that they, it has the best chance of killing things. The other thing is we like to use power washers because it does a great job cleaning. The problem is if it, the pressure is too high, it will actually aerosolize some of those bacteria and viruses and then it's able to transmit it further throughout the barn. So we recommend that your power washers aren't set too high um, or that you're just usually I recommend only using a garden um, nozzle spray on a hose so that you're not going to aerosolize any of um, potential um, pathogens in your facility. 
Other things to consider are fencing, manure management, garbage management, dead stock management. All of these are covered in great detail in the user guide. All right, we're coming down to the last two here. Biosecurity awareness, education, and training. And so I put some pictures of my students. We do a biosecurity um, program in third year with them um, where we actually go through creating biosecurity programs for horses, um, cattle, and, and small animals in clinic situations. Um, what you'll notice on this top picture is this is actually, um, I made a map of our entire facility um, similar to the bird's eye map that I recommend you guys do and, and then I bring in all my toys, apparently I have a lot of little toys there. Um, and the students, I do a strangles outbreak and so I put um, little uh, dots on them whether they have a fever or whether they have clinical signs or not and then they have to go through and try and decide where the faults with that facility, whether it's communal waters or nose-to-nose -nose contact or the way that the manure is moved throughout it. And so they simulate this um, outbreak scenario and then they have to make recommendations. And so doing a similar kind of activity with your um, plan of your facility will get you thinking about those critical points that could be an issue and that you may want to address. Um, practice setting up an isolation facility. Here they've, again, this is our strangles patient and they had to go and collect their supplies. And this, if you actually set it up, then you'll know what you're missing. And so um, going through that. The other thing is with um, per personal protective equipment, while it seems simple, you just put them on, there's actually kind of a fine art to it so that especially when you're taking them off that you don't contaminate yourself underneath. And here, um, one of our students has just contaminated his face while he's all dressed up, he's touched his face. And so um, having someone watch you put on and take off the, the gear is really the only way that you're gonna get practice so that when you do do it, that you don't contaminate yourself and therefore maybe contaminate someone else. And so getting that feedback um, through practice is really important even on farm um, for when you're doing it. The last one is facility location, design and layout and renovations. And obviously beyond the scope of what we're gonna talk here, but it is really important that once you've identified what you need to change, um, that those long-term plans are directed um, uh, or at least followed up to some degree. And there are some, um, over the years, there have been some government grants. Um, we've had some in Alberta where you can identify a biosecurity issue, uh, problem on your farm and there are grants to help um, do some of those changes to the design and layout. Um, but it's also about saving up so that uh, we can do those to, to the properties and, and uh, do our long-term goals as well. And so there are some guidelines um, that can help with that as well in the, in the user guide. So I bring us back to what we said at the beginning, where biosecurity um, is about risk management. And so um, we have to decide what is the risk of disease transmission? What are the consequences of disease occurring in our herd? And if it does get there, what are, what's going to happen? And what are the measures um, that are required to minimize disease? Can we do those? Are they practical? Um, are they feasible for us? And so what do you guys do now? Well, I hope that you will all start to um, develop your own biosecurity program, um, that you make one of those maps and do you um, fill out one of those risk assessments um, and decide on what risks you want to manage and implement. And so is there specific things that are feasible to do today? Are there things that you're going to work on for the next week? Or are there things that, you know, you're looking in the long term? And so while I show the next slides, I've put up a new poll on the side there on what biosecurity measures you will implement immediately after having seen this presentation. And I hope we can get some ideas for everyone, um, everyone to kind of share there. Um, 
I wanted to mention a couple um, very um, important websites for you. So the first one is the Canadian Animal Health Surveillance System, and I briefly saw some mention in the chat down there. Um, this is a program that uh, some of us have been working on over the last, um, I guess it's been since November 2016. Um, this is a website that is Canadian and is um, promoting health surveillance across all of the industry sectors um, uh, of animal health, um, and including a horse um, or equine surveillance network. And so um, you can sign up on our on the CAS website um, to become a member. Um, we do have disease alerts that come through there. Um, the website is uh, I believe just undergone some changes and we have a, a new public um, front to it. There's also some resources on there and um, links. The other one is the Equine Disease Communication Center, which is in the States, although they do do Canadian outbreak um, information or disease updates as well. Um, and this one you can sign up for email alerts to let you know. And this is great if you're traveling um, to the States, you can look to the area so you can um, actually select the state or the province that you're going to. Um, and it'll tell you if there's anything that's ongoing from that area. So a really excellent resource um, for helping you when you're traveling. And then um, these are the, the uh, links that I have on the side over there as well. So for our biosecurity standard for the equine sector, the user guide, um, the Equestrian Canada Emergency Action Planning um, Guide. As well, there is information on the Equestrian Canada Health and Welfare um, site. Um, this is a great video and we'll have these links um, once we get this presentation um, posted onto the Equestrian Canada website as well. Um, that Equine Guelph did on the basics of infectious control goes into a little bit more information on bacteria and viruses and parasites. Um, it's about five minutes long, so it's a quick watch. Um, Equine Guelph Biosecurity and the Alberta Equestrian Federation um, Biosecurity.